chapter twelve part one of love among the artists by george bernard shaw this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twelve at this time jack was richer than he had ever been before his works were performed at the principal concerts he gave lessons at the rate of fifteen guineas a dozen and had more applications for lessons at that rate than he had time to accept publishers tempted him with offers of blank cheques for inane drawing-room ballads with easy accompaniments every evening he went from his lodging in church street to some public entertainment at which he had to play or conduct or to the house of some lady of fashion who considered her reception incomplete without him for society found relief and excitement in the eccentric and often rude manner of the welsh musician and recognized his authority to behave as he pleased at such receptions he received fresh invitations some of which he flatly declined others he accepted presenting himself duly except when he forgot the invitation when he did forget and was reproached by the disappointed hostess he denied all knowledge of her entertainment and said that had he been asked he should have come as he never forgot anything he made no calls left no cards and paid little attention to his dress one afternoon he went to the house of mr phipson who had been of service to him at the ancient orpheus among the guests there was lady geraldine porter mrs herbert's friend whom jack did not know she was a lady of strong common sense resolutely intolerant of the eccentricities and affectations of artists no man who wore a velveteen jacket and long hair had a chance of an introduction to or an invitation from lady geraldine these people she said can behave themselves properly if they like we have to learn manners before we go into society let them do the same since they are so clever as to jack he was her pet aversion society in her opinion had one clear duty to jack to boycott him until he conformed to its reasonable usages and she set an unavailing example by refusing all intercourse with him in the drawing-rooms where they frequently found themselves together when the inevitable entreaty from mrs phipson brought jack to the piano lady geraldine was sitting close behind him and next to mrs herbert there was a buzz of conversation going on and he struck a few chords to stop it those who affected jack worship hushed at the talkers and assumed an expression of enthusiastic expectation the buzz subsided but did not quite cease jack waited patiently thrumming the keyboard still there was not silence he turned round and saw lady geraldine speaking earnestly to mrs herbert heedless of what was passing in the room he waited still with his body twisted towards her and his right hand behind him on the keys until her unconscious breach of good manners becoming generally observed brought about an awful pause mrs herbert hastily warned her by a stealthy twitch she stopped looked up took in the situation and regarded jack's attitude with marked displeasure you mustn't talk he said corrugating his nose you must listen to me lady geraldine's colour rose slightly a phenomenon which no one present had ever witnessed before i beg your pardon she said bowing jack appreciated the dignity of her tone and gesture he nodded approvingly to her disappointment for she had intended to abash him and turning to the piano gave out his theme in the apposite form of a stately minuet upon this he improvised for twenty-five minutes to the delight of the few genuine amateurs present the rest though much fatigued were loud in admiration of jack's genius and many of them crowded about him in the hope of inducing him to give a similar performance at their own houses oh how i adore music said one of them to him later on when he came and sat by her if i were only a great genius like you instead of replying he looked indignantly at her i really do not see why i am not to be supposed capable of appreciating anything she continued protesting against his expression i am very fond of music nobody says you are not said jack you are fond enough of music when it walks in its silver slippers as mr byans was fond of religion the lady who was a born irish protestant a roman catholic by conversion a sort of free thinker after the fashionable broad church manner by habit by conviction nothing at all and very superstitious by nature always suspected some personal application in allusions to religion she looked askance at him and said pettishly 
i wonder you condescend to converse with me at all since you have such a low opinion of me i like talking to you except when you go into rhapsodies over music do you know why i am sure i don't she said with a little laugh and a glance at him why because you are a chatterbox said jack relishing the glance don't think madam that it is because you are kindred spirit and musical i hate musical people who is that lady sitting next mrs herbert what you don't know that explains your temerity she is lady geraldine porter and you are the first mortal that has ever ventured to rebuke her it was delicious is that the lady who would not have me at her house yes you have revenged yourself though plenty of fools will say so and therefore i am sorry i spoke to her however i cannot be expected to know trifles of this kind though i am in the confidence of pretty mrs saunders have you any wicked stories to tell me to-day no except what everybody knows and what i suppose you knew before anybody about your friend miss sutherland and adrian herbert what about them tell me nothing about miss sutherland unless you are sure it is true i do not want to hear anything unpleasant of her you need not be so cross said mrs saunders coolly you can ask her for the particulars the main fact is that mr herbert who was engaged to her is going to marry szimplica the pianist pshaw that is an old story he has been seen speaking to her once or twice and of course now mr jack let me tell you that it is not the old story which was mere gossip i never repeat gossip it is a new story and a true one old madame szimplica told me all about it her daughter actually refused mr herbert because of his former engagement and then he went straight to mary sutherland and asked her to give up her claim which of course she had to do poor girl then he went back to the szimplica and prevailed with her miss sutherland with all her seriousness showed that she knows her metier as well as the most frivolous of her sex as myself if you like for she set to work at once to express her remorse at having jilted him how transparent all our little artifices are after all mr jack i don't believe a word of it you shall see i did not believe it myself at first but miss sutherland told me in this very room the day before yesterday that mr herbert was no longer engaged to her and that she particularly wished it to be understood that if there was any blame in the matter it was due to her and not to him of course i took in the situation at once she said it admirably almost implying that she was magnanimously eager to shield poor adrian herbert from my busy tongue poor mary she is well rid of him if she only knew it i wonder who will be the next candidate for the post he has deserted mrs saunders as she wondered glanced at jack's eyes why need she fill it at all every woman's head is not occupied with stuff of that sort jack spoke gruffly and seemed troubled after a few moments during which she leaned back lazily and smiled at him he rose good-bye he said you are not very amusing to-day i suppose you are telling this fine story of yours to whoever has time to listen to it not at all mr jack everybody is telling it to me i am quite tired of it jack uttered a grunt and left her meeting mrs herbert he made his bow and asked where miss sutherland was she is in the conservatory said mrs herbert hesitating but i think she will be engaged there for some time he thanked her and wandered through the rooms for five minutes then his patience being exhausted he went into the conservatory where he saw lady geraldine apparently arguing some point with mary who stood before her looking obstinately downward it is quixotic nonsense lady geraldine was saying as jack entered he has behaved very badly and you know it as well as i do only you feel bound to put yourself in a false position to screen him that is where i disagree with you lady geraldine i think my position the true one and the one you would have me take the false one my dear listen to me do you not see that your efforts to exculpate adrian only convince people of his meanness the more you declare you deserted him the more they are certain that it is a case of sour grapes and that you are making the common excuse of girls who are jilted don't be angry with me nothing but brutal plain speaking will move you you told bell woodward bell saunders i mean that the fault was yours do you suppose she believed you of course said mary vehemently but evidently shocked by this view of the case then you are mistaken said jack advancing she has just given me the very version that this lady has so sensibly put to you lady geraldine turned and looked at him in a way that would have swept an ordinary man speechless from the room 
mary accustomed to him did not think of resenting his interference and said after considering distressedly for a moment but it is not my fault if mrs saunders chooses to say what is not true i cannot adapt what has really happened to what she or anybody else may think i don't know what has really happened said jack but you can hold your tongue and that is the proper thing for you to do it is none of their business it is none of yours either to whitewash herbert whether he needs it or not i beg your pardon ma'am he added turning ceremoniously to lady geraldine i should have retired on seeing miss sutherland engaged had i not accidentally overheard the excellent advice you were giving her with that he made her his best old-fashioned bow and went away well really said lady geraldine staring after him is this the newest species of artistic affectation pray it used to be priggishness or loutishness or exquisite sensibility but now it seems to be outspoken common sense and instead of being a relief it is the most insufferable affectation of all my dear i hope i have not distressed you oh this world is not fit for any honest woman to live in cried mary indignantly it has some base construction to put on every effort to be just and tell the truth if i had done my best to blacken adrian after deserting him i should be at no loss now for approval and sympathy as it is i am striving to do what is right and i am made to appear contemptible for my pains it is not a very honest world i grant you said lady geraldine quietly but it is not so bad as you think young people quarrel with it because it will not permit them to be heroic in season and out of season you have made a mistake and if you want to be heroic out of season on the strength or rather the weakness of that mistake i who know you well do not suppose as bell saunders does that you are consciously making a virtue of a necessity but i think there is a little spiritual pride in your resolution not to be betrayed into reproaching adrian in fact all quixoticism is tainted with spiritual vainglory and that is the reason that no one likes it or even admires it heartily in real life besides my dear nobody really cares a bit how adrian behaved or how you behaved they only care about the facts and the facts i must say are plain enough you and adrian were unwise enough to enter into a long engagement you get tired of one another wait till i have finished and then protest your fill adrian went behind your back and proposed to another woman who was more honourable than he and refused to let him smuggle her into your place then instead of coming to demand his freedom straightforwardly he came to fish for it to entrap you into offering it to him and he succeeded the honest demand came from you instead of from him but i fished too said mary piteously i was only honest when he drove me to it of course said lady geraldine impatiently you are not an angel and the sooner you reconcile yourself to the few failings which you share with the rest of us the happier you will be none of us are honest in such matters except when our conscience drives us to it the honestest people are only those who feel the constraint soonest and strongest if you had held out a little longer adrian might have forestalled you i say he might but in my opinion he would most probably have fastened a quarrel on you about jack or somebody else and got out of his engagement that way oh no for he spoke about mr jack and said expressly that he did not mind him at all but that if he had brought about any change in my feelings i need not feel bound by the in there i know that is an additional proof of his faithlessness in your eyes it is a proof of what a thorough fool a man must be to expect you to take such a bait please release me mr herbert that i may gratify my fancy for mr jack that is such a likely thing for a woman to say i hope you are not in earnest about mr jack lady geraldine i am not pleased about him mary these friendships stand in a girl's way of course i know you are not in love with him at least accustomed as i am to the folly of men and women about one another even i cannot conceive such infatuation but mary do not flourish your admiration for his genius i suppose he has genius in the faces of other men i will go back to windsor and get clear of mr jack and mr herbert both i wish people would mind their own business they never do dear but it is time for us to go have i dashed your spirits very much not at all replied mary absently then if you are quite gay you need not object to come somewhere with me this evening you mean to go out somewhere i cannot lady geraldine i should only be a wet blanket i am not in the vein for society to-day thank you all the same for trying to rescue me from my own thoughts nonsense mary you must come it is only to the theatre 
mrs herbert and we two will make a quiet party after what has passed you cannot meet her too soon and i know she is anxious to show that she does not mean to take adrian's part against you oh i have no doubt of that so far from it that i am afraid adrian will think i am going to her to complain of him there she added seeing that this last doubt was too much for lady geraldine's patience i will come i know i am very hard to please but indeed i did not feel in the humour for theatre going you will be ready at half-past seven mary consented sighed and left the conservatory dejectedly with lady geraldine who on returning to the drawing-room had another conference with mrs herbert meanwhile jack after chatting a while with mrs saunders prepared to depart he had put off his afternoon's work in order to be at mr phipson's disposal and he felt indolent and morally lax in consequence stopping as he made his way to the door to speak to several ladies who seldom received even a nod from him on the stairs he met the youngest miss phipson aged five years and he lingered a while to chat with her he then went down to the hall and was about to leave the house when he heard his name pronounced sweetly behind him he turned and saw lady geraldine at whom he gazed in unconcealed surprise i forgot to thank you for your timely aid in the conservatory she said in her most gracious manner i wonder whether you will allow me to ask for another and greater favour what is it said jack suspiciously mrs herbert replied lady geraldine with a polite simulation of embarrassment is going to make use of my box at the theatre this evening and she has asked me to bring miss sutherland there we are very anxious that you should accompany us if you have no important engagement as i am the nominal owner of the box may i beg you to come with us jack was not satisfied the invitation was unaccountable to him as he knew perfectly well what lady geraldine thought of him instead of answering he stood looking at her in a perplexity which expressed itself unconsciously in hideous grimaces will you allow me to send my carriage to your house she said when the pause became unbearable yes no i'll join you at the theatre will that do lady geraldine resenting his manner put strong constraint on herself as with careful courtesy she told him the name of the theatre and the hour of the performance he listened to her attentively but gave no sign of assent when she had finished speaking he looked absently up the staircase showed his teeth and hammered a tune on his chin with the edge of his hat the strain on lady geraldine's forbearance became very great indeed may we depend on your coming she said at last why do you want me to come she exclaimed suddenly you don't like me lady geraldine drew back a step then losing patience she said sharply what answer do you expect me to make to that mr jack none said he with mock gravity it is unanswerable from kafarsalama on eagle wings i fly and after making her another bow he left the house chuckling as he disappeared mrs herbert came downstairs and joined lady geraldine well she said is mary to be made happy at our expense yes said lady geraldine i bearded the monster here and got what i deserved for my pains the man is a savage i told you what to expect that did not make it a bit pleasanter you had better come and dine with me sir john is going to greenwich and we may as well enjoy ourselves together up to the last moment that evening mary sutherland reluctantly accompanied mrs herbert and lady geraldine to the theatre to witness the first performance in england of a newly translated french drama when she had been a few minutes seated in their box she was surprised by the entry of jack whose black silk kerchief which he persisted in wearing instead of a necktie was secured with a white pin showing that he had dressed himself with unusual care mr jack exclaimed mary just so mr jack he said hanging his only hat which had suffered much from wet weather and bad usage on a peg behind the door did you not expect him mary about to say no hesitated and glanced at lady geraldine i see you did not said jack placing his chair behind hers a surprise eh an agreeable surprise said mrs herbert smoothly with her fan before her lips an accidental one said lady geraldine i forgot to tell miss sutherland that you had been good enough to promise to come mrs herbert is laughing at me said jack good-humouredly so are you it is you who were good enough to ask me not i who was good enough to come listen to the band those eighteen or twenty bad players cost more than six good ones would and are not half so agreeable to listen to do you hear what they are playing can you imagine anyone writing such stuff it certainly sounds exceedingly ugly 
but i am notoriously unmusical so my opinion is not worth anything still so far as you can judge you don't like it certainly not i am beginning to like it said mrs herbert coolly i am quite aware that it is one of your own compositions or some arrangement of one ha <laughs> ha souvenirs of jack they call it this is what a composer has to suffer whenever he goes to a public entertainment lady geraldine in revenge for which he ungenerously lays traps for others mr jack you are right said jack suddenly becoming moody it was ungenerous but i shared the discomfiture there they go at my fantasia accursed be the man hark the dog has taken it upon himself to correct the harmony he ceased speaking and leaned forward on his elbows grinding his teeth and muttering mary in low spirits herself made an effort to soothe him surely you do not care about such a trifle as that she began what harm you call it a trifle he said interrupting her threateningly certainly interposed lady geraldine in ironically measured tones a composer such as you can afford to overlook an ephemeral travesty to which nobody is listening were i in your place i would not suffer a thought of resentment to ruffle the calm surface of my contempt for it wouldn't you said jack sarcastically tell me one thing you are very rich as rich in money as i am in music would you like to be robbed of a sovereign i am not fond of being robbed at all mr jack aha neither am i you wouldn't miss the sovereign people would think you stingy for thinking about it perhaps i can afford to be misrepresented by a rascally fiddler for a few nights here as well as you can afford the pound but i don't like it you are always unanswerable said lady geraldine good-humouredly jack stood up and looked round the theatre all the world and his wife are here to-night he said that white-haired gentleman hiding at the back of the balcony is the father of an old pupil of mine a man cursed with an ungovernable temper his name is brailsford the youth with the eyeglass in the stalls is a critic he called me a promising young composer the other day who is that coming into the box nearly opposite the szimplica is it not i see madame's topknot coming through the inner gloom she takes the best seat of course just as naturally as if she was a child at her first pantomime there is a handsome gentleman with a fair beard dimly visible behind it must be master adrian he has a queer notion of life that chap he added forgetting that he was in the presence of that chap's mother mrs herbert looked round gravely at him and lady geraldine frowned he did not notice them he was watching mary who had shrunk for a moment behind the curtain but was now sitting in full view of herbert looking straight at the stage from which the curtain had just gone up end of chapter twelve part one Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine.